when it comes down to metrics and things of that nature, I would ideally like to see them squat at least two times their body weight. I would like to see them press and perf- preferably a horizontal press at least one times their body weight and pull something off the ground two and a half times body weight. Hello, friends. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of the Main Idea Podcast, where today I have the pleasure of sitting down with Phil Daru. Brief housekeeping. I want to take a second and thank everyone who ordered a rash guard off the website to support the show. It sold out extremely quick, so I wasn't able to extend the purchase window any longer. However, Because of the success here, I will be doing another merchandise drop later in 2024. The best way to stay up to date on that kind of stuff is to join the mailing list at www.mainideapodcast.com. There you can become part of the community. I will not spam you. It will only be information that's pertinent to the show. And for the true fans, please take 30 seconds and leave a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. This helps so much with organic discovery and helps me to continually bring on incredible guests. There's also timestamps in the show notes, so feel free to jump around to the part that interests you most, although I always recommend listening to the episode in its entirety. Phil Daru is a world-renowned strength and conditioning coach and founder of Daru Strong. He has worked with some of the most elite combat sports athletes from Dustin Poirier and Junior Dos Santos to Colby Covington and Joanna Yevchenchik. He has been featured on ESPN, Fox Sports, Luke Thomas Podcast, Mark Bell's Power Podcast, and many more, making him one of the most sought-after MMA strength and conditioning minds in the game. I hope that you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Without further ado, Phil Daru. Well, Phil, I've been uh, very excited to have you on the show, man. I really appreciate it. You truly are one of the busiest coaches in the game, both with professional athletes, professional fighters, and you're a unique guest because not only do you have experience in the cage fighting, you're also someone with a knack for studying and research and the science behind training, and you're well-versed in the mechanics. So you bring to the table something that's truly unique in combat sports. So the fact that you're here really means a lot, man. Uh, thank you, man. It means a lot for you to have me here, though, so I appreciate the time. So when you think of strength training, Ooh. there is this trade-off and opportunity cost that's always present when you're training, especially when you have professional athletes because they have to go do the thing that they're competing in at some point, whether it's mm-hmm. a fight that they're getting ready for or a match or a game, whatever it is. So there's always this trade-off of time and training. And mm-hmm. when you think of strength how much strength is enough strength and how much strength is too much strength when we're talking about combat sports? And how do you as the coach manage that with these high level performers that you work with? It's a good question. A lot of times when you're looking at athletes, the sport that I work with primarily MMA, but boxing too, as well, um, they come in with a large amount of skill acquisition already built in from years of training, the actual, the sport. What we find is that with with strength and power and just performance training in general, it gives them an X factor. Mm-hmm. So if they're coming in to training with me, at least, and they have a they don't have a background in strength and conditioning, the goal is to get them to be as strong as possible so that they can correlate over into the actual sport. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that goes without saying, but if you look at it, a large amount of my time is predicated towards getting them stronger. Because yeah. there, that is the limiter in most uh, cases. Mm-hmm. So we want them to be relatively strong for the weight class. We want them to be able to be able to produce force fast. And we do that through the means of training that will be conducive to what they're doing inside the cage or the ring or the mats. So getting them strong enough to be able to not be overpowered, but still mm-hmm. be able to do the sport a- at hand. Not eliminating or reducing their skill, their technique, right? The actual, uh, their game plan, things of that nature. So getting them to be able to produce force fast, getting them to be able to absorb force is very highly important for us. Now, when it comes down to metrics and things of that nature, you know, mm-hmm. I would ideally like to see them squat at least two times their body weight. I would like to see them press and perf- 
preferably a horizontal press at least one time their body weight and pull something off the ground two and a half times body weight. Now that's a standard for me. Um, yep. it, it is dependent upon the individual. It also depends upon the weight class, so on and so forth. Like a heavy weight, you obviously want them to be a little bit more stronger um, than let's say a bantam weight, right? Where the goal primarily with them are gonna be being able to last and be in good condition so that they can go all five rounds or three rounds or whatever the case may be. And so are you taking that uh, that number, so t two times their body weight, right? To pull off the ground in like a, a deadlift or a deadlift variation. Are you doing that based on their walk around weight or are you doing that based on like if they've already gone through weigh-ins, you want to hypothetically have them able to perform that at their fighting weight in the cage on the day? Or how does that work with their weight cuts and their walk around weight versus their training weight versus fight weight? Yeah, if their walk around weight, especially if they are fighting pretty consistently throughout the year, you want them right around 15 to 20 percent of their scale weight. Okay. So they want them right around the same weight that they're going to be at once they rehydrate up, right? So let's okay. say a 155 pounder is going to walk around at like 178 to 180. That would be right. ideal. Maybe 181 at, at most. Um, an individual like Dustin Poirier will walk around 181, 179, somewhere around there, and he'll cut to 155 comfortably um, as much as he can, right? So like right. we want to predicate the weight based on that, not so gotcha. much the weight class. God, it must just be such a trip. Like y you get, actually, what are your thoughts on like athleticism? Because mm. f fight combat sports are interesting in that you can have a guy, I've, he I've heard you reference this before, but you have a guy like Edson Barbosa, right? Mm -hmm. Who by kind of all measures of the word is like a freak athlete. The guy's yeah. He's extremely cut. He's, his plyometric ability is unreal. His ability mm -hmm. to generate power in all these different mechanical movements of fight sports are untenable. Yet he can go in there and you can get kind of trucked by someone who's like, uh, looks like maybe you'd find them in like a shitty bar on the weekend, right? So it's cool. not like uh, football or basketball. It's this mixed up arena where you can have athletes and non-athletes compete at an equally high level. So when you're taking guys in, you know, working with someone like Dustin Poirier, working with someone like Edson Barbosa, how do you look at these two people and assess the, the best way for them to move forward based on the skills that they have? And what meters do you want to dial up and what ones are you completely yeah. okay with them maintaining? True. I mean, it, it all depends on what we see in the beginning of the assessment process, right? So I'm looking at limiters based on bioenergetic demands, whether it be energy systems that maybe they're really more competent in using. That could be utilization of oxygen as opposed to the, the delivery of oxygen, right? They may have right. a better gas tank than an aerobic gas tank. So I'm looking at that outside of the camp, and I want mm -hmm. to plug in those gaps as much as possible um, from a limiter perspective, reduce those limiters. And then once we get into camp, we want to hone it in on their actual game plan and their compensators. So now, obviously, we're still going to work their limiters and try to improve. But the main focus is going to be getting them ready and prepared for what they're going to be doing inside of the cage or the ring. Right. So let's say in the case of Edson, Edson is very explosive, right? He has great repeatability. It's improving on his aerobic capacity, which is going to plug the gap gaps for us to yep. increase increase his overall performance level going further. So, when I look at, like, let's say for instance, he, we'll talk about Edson because that's what you brought up. But like, yep. Edson is if he if he ate like crap the entire camp, he would still yeah. look the same, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tisha Torres the same the same way. Yep. Um, I think the main thing for us is finding out what their actual limiter is and then plug in those gaps accordingly. And if somebody has a strength deficiency or a bilateral deficit for that, for that particular reason, let's say they had a, an injury, right? And right. they need to get stronger in certain ways. I'm also looking at specific demands. I'm looking at specific biometrics. So like if I can see them, having an issue with turning over certain punches, or I mm -hmm. see them having an issue with stopping takedowns, then I'm going to look at the body as a whole. I'm going to look at their structure. Maybe it's a mobility issue. Maybe it's a strength issue in certain positions. Right. Then we can increase the mobility. We can increase the active and range control and strengthen up those positions too, but also strengthen up the muscles and bias out that muscle um, to help them correlate that all in. 
Yeah, it's it's such a mixed bag. Like, I, I, I know from just coaching general population, right? You get someone in, you do a diagnostics on them or some sort of intake, and yep. you come up with this rubric. Like, okay, look, this person has limitations in their hip mobility or their overhead ability to sustain weight, whatever it is, and you want to work towards that. So, and in a perfect world, you train them seven days a week and they sleep great and they eat exactly how you tell them and they show up early and they get their mobility done and they're ready to go when the session starts. The reality yeah. of being a coach is that's like 99% not true ever. So you're yeah. always working on borrowed time, borrowed yeah. exercise selection, and then there's life factors. People, fighters, yeah. athletes, they got families. People have other demands outside of this thing that we do for a career. And mm -hmm. it becomes challenging to jumble those. When you get someone like Dustin Poirier or you get someone like Edson in there or Johanna and you're talking about this, you're talking about like, hey, we have X amount of weeks until you fight, until you're in there with someone else who's trying to take your head off. Mm -hmm. What's your hierarchy of, mm -hmm. of strength structure with them? And what are those conversations like to get them to buy in? Because mm -hmm. you do know what's best from a strength and, and uh, mobility and movement standpoint. They got to trust you a lot in that. Yeah, I mean, getting the numbers down from a baseline perspective and showcasing that does help us a lot because the numbers don't lie, right? So if I can like data, what's that? Like showing them data of like, hey, this is actually where yeah. your power production is at. Period. Yeah, like even if we did a force velocity profile or a reactive strength index and trying to find those deficits. And I can show them through that data, okay, this is why we need to get stronger. This is why we need to increase force production because it's limiting your power production. It's limiting your ability to do what you do inside of the cage. And then you give them exercises that have high transfer that they can see. And then you reframe it with a cueing technique to allow them to buy into the situation. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah, totally. I've, uh, through consuming your content online and and checking out the just like thorough library that you have on youtube one thing that i've always felt that you do really well is you give a why behind the what so you yeah. show like hey this is what we're doing but this is actually i'm not just grabbing a kettlebell because it looks cool and it's going to trend well on views and stuff yeah. this is actually why we're using this piece of equipment so that you the the listener the hobbyist whatever can have mm -hmm. a payout and cool. in the face of social media right there's this huge drive in training for specificity. If it doesn't look like the sport, it can't possibly be good for the sport, so don't do it. Yeah. So everything is punching with bands around the fist or it's doing yeah. this or that. When you look at a sport that's as complex as mixed martial arts or combat sports in general, we can expand this to grappling, jujitsu, ADCC mm -hmm. rules, IBJJF rules, whatever it is. What are like your kind of most core principles about improving that person's ability, regardless of how it looks relative to the movements of the sport? Like, mm. what are those stone principles that are everyone could kind of adopt and go, hey, I'm a guy that trains a couple times a week at the local gym. Mm. Implementing this kind of approach is something that's going to pay off for me. I, I mean, honestly, foundational patterns, you know, a squat, hinge, press, pull, rotation. If you can get those in locomotion, learning how to run, learning how to move your body in space that's going to be appropriate for any walk of life, right? Improving on grip strength, improving on, you know, your ability to produce force from any position, an static position primarily, right? If you're looking at compound movements, you want to work that too as well. Not only is it going to help you with coordination, but it's also going to increase growth hormone. It's going to increase testosterone. It's going to allow you to be a better human. Yeah. I think a lot of people neglect, especially people that just go to the gym, they neglect small stabilizer muscles. So like the intrinsic muscles of the feet or in right. grip strength, right? For instance, or even neck strength. Um, people neglect that just because it's not sexy. It's not something that they can see or from an aesthetic standpoint, maybe it's not something that people notice, you know, right. from, from the jump or off the jump, but it is necessary for you to be healthy, to be well-balanced and to improve functionality overall. So I think anybody can really uh, benefit from those. It's interesting you mentioned the the bottom of the foot. Like if if you go into any academy, whether it's like a, a mixed martial arts gym or a jiu-jitsu gym, mm. you, you're doing it without shoes on. It's not yeah. boxing. It's not wrestling. You're doing it without shoes. Every single thing you do from a spider grip to your footwork in, in a Muay Thai position, mm -hmm. it's done barefoot. Yet yep. you go to the gym and you look at people's footwear and they're walking around on clouds with zero mm. feedback and no attention to their feet. And then they're neglecting their neck, which is the most 
uh, vulnerable thing on your whole body that's just this coil fo floating in space. How do you address these two areas of the body with your athletes? Well, a lot of times, either if we don't have like the ability to train them barefoot, we'll put them in vivo barefoot. So obviously, you guys yep. have been seeing that wear. I've been wearing these shoes for five years now. Same. Uh, we're, we're partners uh, as far as you know with them helping. Pretty much, they outfitted my entire gym. All my coaches, all my athletes Epic. wear it. You know, so it allows us to really feel the ground, right? Yeah. It allows us to strengthen up the foot and work the foot as it as it's supposed to be. Um, mm -hmm. Then from there, I'm looking at different balance techniques and base support system prep that I use um, just to get the get the neuromuscular system firing, get the muscles firing up inside of the foot so that they can produce force all the way up the kinetic chain. Right. And I think that what ends up happening is when you throw on different shoes that, you know, like I said, the soft soles or like high heels and things like that, they really don't get a chance to really let their foot breathe and right. expand and produce force and feel the ground as it's supposed to. So we lose that that primal effect of how yes. we are supposed to be moving in space. So I think that that is a key factor for me, even in even in MMA and, and, and so on, it's like. If they're going to do strength and conditioning, why not have them perform in ways that they're going to be doing inside the competition? So, right. again, we're working in barefoot. Let's go ahead and train barefoot, you know? With that in mind, I I'm always curious on the Olympic lifting shoe side because mm -hmm. I used to compete in Olympic weightlifting. And mm -hmm. now doing jiu-jitsu, I use very few of those movements. And mm -hmm. I can recognize the value of a shoe as adding stability and adding more range to people that have limitations. So in a sport that you get tons of people from all different walks of life, sizes and mobility, it mm -hmm. kind of makes sense that there's this, this item there. And there's some better options now with uh, like squat university has that wide toe box, uh, yep. Olympic lifting shoe. But if you're working with an athlete and you're doing something like tower cleans or thrusters or work that would be traditionally done in that type of footwear, Mm -hmm. Are you moving that towards a barefoot shoe or barefoot? How do you incorporate that stuff? If I ever incorporate Olympic lifting, it's mm -hmm. going to be something very, I, I would say minimal in range of motion, right? Because they have to have gotcha. the requisites. They have to be able to get overhead. Yep. Um, a lot of times it's, it's, it's highly technical, right? So yeah. from a technique standpoint, weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting is a sport and yep with a weightlifting shoe, it's a part of the, the gear that they have to utilize to help them with the actual lift. So with our guys, the goal isn't to be a better weightlifter. It is to be a better fighter. Now, right. increasing strength, power, explosiveness, all of that is going to allow them to be a better fighter, but I want to get them in the best position possible to do so. So right. it may not be an Olympic lift. It may be a kettlebell swing. It may be a landmine press or a clean and press something that they can do structurally that'll give us the biggest bang for our buck without risk of injury. So if I ever do decide to get to that, you know, that perspective, if we need to utilize those, whatever it is, weightlifting shoes in that perspective mm -hmm. to do the lift, I wouldn't mind it. But at the end of the day, we have to get them out of the shoe because again, from a specificity standpoint, they're not going to be utilizing the shoe. They're not going to be utilizing right. straps, so on and so forth. But if we're trying to focus on bringing up a, a triple extension or something like that. Right. Really, my goal is to find the tools necessary for us to get the stimulus adaptation without having to worry about too much technical efficiency um, right. or something highly technical that takes them away from their game because their game is to be a better fighter. Yeah, and I guess that goes back to that like time trade off, right? To to get someone yeah. who has like decent hip mobility to great hip mobility to where they're <laughs> safe doing a movement. If that takes a month out of your time, that's a horrible investment, right? Or can be, I, I, I guess. Like, I feel like you can concurrently work that in while mm -hmm. you're getting stronger, though. Right? Mobility, stability, flexibility, all of that stuff can be integrated into the actual time of training, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I use the conjugate concurrent style of an approach. But that's, that's, that's more of an adaptation that is necessary for them to improve upon, especially right. if they lack it to a degree yeah. of where it's hindering their actual game. So if the person needs mobility, that may be our focus point. And then right. our secondary may be strength and our tertiary may be power. 
right? right. So we look at these hierarchy of, hi, the hierarchy of importance based on the individual. And then I just go down the line and reverse engineer. Right. right. So an individual at the, at the start of it, I'm like, they're strong. Like I got an individual by the name of Jake Boswick, right? Everybody knows Jake. Um, the bare knuckle fighters got the tattoo on his face. Yep. Right. The guy's one of my most, it was one of the strongest athletes I've ever coached. One of the strongest fighters for sure. Hands down explosive, but he's lacks mobility. So mm -hmm. we hit on mobility because I know if I get him more mobile, it's going to enhance his power production. It's going to increase his endurance because he's not straining as much. It's also going to help his game out. It's going to help his skills. Totally. Train. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, I mean, I'm looking at it from a hierarchy of an important standpoint. If I'm trying to mold or fit somebody into like a powerlifting stance or an Olympic lifting stance or, you know, whatever, it has to make sense for the time that we have. And if that individual is very uh, competent in lifting weights and we want to go after it, like I got, I got a young guy by the name of Tyler Ray, who I can throw as much weight on the bar as possible. I know he's not going to get hurt because he has a, a lifting background. Right. So now I can tell him, okay, let's go hit, let's go hit some conventional deadlifts or let's go hit some sumos or let's go front squat and i know that he'll be able to do it very very he, he has great confidence in that right he's really right. good there so it allows me to improve his strength through the tools necessary for him to do so because i know that he is competent enough to do it yeah i, I saw a clip of you um working with eddie gallagher and i thought it was really interesting you were talking about back squats and you're basically like dude just shut it down like it was such yeah. a definitive we're not doing that Period. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense for you. And I think that that's, I, I feel for the average person who's interested in trying to get better at sport, like they want to get stronger so they can do better in the things they like to do, whether it's martial arts, jujitsu, striking, surfing, hiking, whatever it is, because the mountain of information in front of everyone is so tall and super cloudy. Yeah. And so I think it's easy for people to find like, you know, reduce down to the thing that they know. And so they end up back squatting, they end up deadlifting, regardless of mechanics, and they end up doing running, right? So they want to cover their bases, they end up doing these things. Yeah. If you're talking like, what is what's something that you've learned from working with general population people that you didn't learn from working with world class athletes, <laughs> that's applicable? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you kind of hit it. It's like, don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we got to find out what the proper joint prerequisites for that individual is. And, and when they do have that, give them the tools necessary for them to go all out in it. Right? right. So I think people get stuck in this one dimensional side of thinking where you have to squat, you have to back squat or you have to deadlift or you have to bench press. I get that. Yep. You know, so there's always a way to get stronger. If the goal is to get stronger by any means necessary, we'll find out the tools that is necessary or that is effective and efficient for them to do that. Yeah. Now, if you're trying to get into a strength sport and the actual sport is back squat, deadlift and bench press or, right. you know, clean and, uh, clean and snatch, like I understand that. And then you have to inc increase your range of motion. You have to increase your technical efficiency through that. Uh, right. But for general population, just trying to get fit or to stay fit, to live healthy, we want to work on movement patterns that are going to be good. We're going to work on movement patterns that are going to allow them to be strong, allow them to be functionally capable of doing things in everyday life, right? Yep. And then improving or increasing longevity. So if running degrades that, then that's obviously not the route we want to take. Right. You know what I'm I'd rather you go swim or I'd rather you go bike or something that's lower impact until you have the functionality, until you have the prerequisites to do so. So I think that that's one thing that a lot of people miss and a lot of young trainers do uh, wrong was they feel they need to do this because it says this in a book or I read right. it somewhere or I watched this guy do something and it's just not that. You got to have one, I think a lot of young trainers miss is proper communication skills mm -hmm. and then being able to think on the fly and auto-regulate if necessary and they feel like yeah. they can't auto-regulate because they don't have the ability to adapt they're not diverse enough or they don't think in different dimensions and they're really one track minded and so that that ends up being a detriment to the actual people that they're working with yeah training such a framework it's it's such a 
it's not a concrete framework. It's a framework that you can constantly shift and move around and you have to, to accommodate people's varying, their readiness, their attitude, their motivations, all those things are going to, they're going to scale up and down throughout the course of their life training with you. And so if you're not willing to accommodate that, it's, it's a disservice to them and it's unfortunate for you and ultimately your business because it's going to affect that downline. Well, when, it'll, uh, affect, it'll affect results and, yeah. And you're putting your clients at risk for injury, which isn't a, mm-hmm. obviously is not a great thing either, right? So that gets around right. fast in the private sector. When you look back on on your time as a fighter and then your time coaching fighters, yeah. what's something that you've given up that you kind of used to look at dogmatically as like an absolutely necessary, must be in every single program? I do this every single week. Uh, that now you have a different perspective on. That's a really good question. As a fighter, uh, I thought that I had to, this was back when I was in my early 20s, but I always thought that I had to push it to the limit, right? I had to push it to the high intensity zones and feel like I was dead leaving the gym, right? Every time. And yep. at 21, 22, I could do that. You know, at 35, you're not doing that shit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> not, it's just not. I know. I hate it, dude. I hate it. I'm like, ah. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. Slowing the process down a little bit more and, and yeah. really, you know, picking your battles in a sense, right? Working with veteran fighters, too, allowed me to understand this more. And also, even with even with skills training, with sparring, even. Like, we, yeah. we table sparring. You don't have to spar hard every time. You really don't even have to spar hard, you know, once a week, even, if, if it's not necessary, right? If the yeah. individual knows how to throw a punch and take a punch or a kick or whatever – you really want to focus on technique. You want to focus on timing. You want to focus on yeah. just being in there, you know, and the same thing goes for strength training. As long as you touch something heavy, you know, and you get that for the amount of volume necessary for you to cause a great adaptation and to keep that stimulus going, then you're good to go. You don't need to always go to a maximum. I remember, you know, a mentor of mine, Louis Simmons, the late, great Louis Simmons always used to say, you don't train maximally. We don't train minimally. We always train optimally. And so when Love I, that. And, and this is from a this is a guy that pushed it to the limits, broke yeah, his back, dude. <laughs> right? So if anybody's gonna listen to something like that, it's gonna be from from that individual, right? So yeah. I, I guess that would be the main thing that I could see uh, that it's, it's a total change in my perspective. I I hate. The, the only thing I hate in life that I feel comfortable saying hate is is this idea that like the willingness with which people accept age as an excuse to stop pursuing a, like a good version of themselves, you know, and, and it's hard. Like I'm, I'm gonna be 35 in January. This mm-hmm. has been the year that Welcome I've dedicated. To- yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I've dedicated more time this year than any other year in my life to learning how to recover better. And it's been an endeavor in and of itself, right? Like you have to dedicate time to keeping your body at a homeostasis versus like you said, 21, you just, you roll out of bed at midnight and you yep. smash weights for two hours and then you go to sleep, you do it all over again the next day and there's zero lag time in your recovery. Yeah. And it's something I see a lot in academies, like people, uh, they coming into jiu-jitsu and they're just so banged up, man. And they're, mm-hmm. they're not willing to give themselves that, that time to recover. When mm-hmm. you assess recovery, it, it's obviously, be, you know, come to the forefront in the fitness industry over the past decade as like being this instrumental part of your training as much part of your training as your training is your training. So mm-hmm. when you look to all these different modalities that you see now from sauna to cold plunge to sleep tracking to massage guns, what are things that you actually feel like are, are valuable that you see a, a payoff for your athletes where you're comfortable going, Hey, Dustin, this week, I want you doing X. I want you doing Y and I want you doing Z and don't worry about the other shit because you got a fight coming up. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, and you probably already heard this before, but sleep. I mean, yeah. getting real, adequate, restful sleep, where they're not waking up in the middle of the night, um, you know, nasal breathing throughout the night as opposed to mouth breathing, you know, and quality, quality nutrition, making sure that they're getting the proper macronutrients and micronutrients throughout that week so that they can recover appropriately. Now, other things you can throw in there, obviously sauna sessions have helped us a lot. More so the contrast baths. So from the cold to the hot, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And that can be done in any which way. 
but just getting something hot, getting something cold, go back and forth. What you're doing is obviously with the cold, you're in, you know, you're, you're decreasing inflammation with the hot, you're relaxing the tissue. Let's yeah. keep it very basic and simple. That's what you're doing, right? And there's other yeah. mechanisms and there's things along the lines from a physiological perspective that is helping, you know, that and, and the, the studies and the data are out there conflicting in, in a lot of ways. But for the most part, that's what you're doing, right? You're right. decreasing inflammation, you're relaxing the muscle. So that along, along with, honestly, meditation, meditative breathing, right? Nasal breathing, box breathing, these things allow for the central nervous system to calm down, bring your body into more of a parasympathetic state. You know, we brought in even a guy that helps us with breathing techniques um, inside of, of actual rounds that has helped too as Love well. Love that. Did you um, guys work with like Oxygen Advantage or any of so those guys? I got, got certified in Oxygen Advantage and we've been using, yeah. we've been using music for a long time. Yeah. Uh, breath holds, things like that, mini breath holds, nasal breathing, obviously. Um, we do um, intermittent hypoxic training too as well. That's not for recovery, but that's another training stimulus, you know, but a form of box breathing, a form of Uteco method, and then, you know, utilizing the breath and utilizing cold therapy, heat shock therapy or heat shock proteins in the heat, that is going to definitely help overall. Massage, right? Deep tissue massage or just a regular relaxation, like a uh, recovery massage has been helpful. I just got a massage actually before we did the podcast. Nice. Um, like, like I'm still training, you know, one or two times a day. Yep. So, I mean, I, I still need to get my recovery. But the one thing that I could say overall, and you can go through, you know, supplementation, maybe it's creatine, maybe it's amino acids, whatever. Yeah. It, it does depend on the individual. I think nothing is going to be proper nutrition, hydration, right? Electrolytes, sleep, quality sleep. And breathing normally, not over breathing, right? Mm -hmm. They talk a lot about that in Buteco Method is like, or in, in Oxygen Advantage, uh, Patrick McCune, shout out to Patrick McCune. It's over breathing. A lot of people tend to just breathe too much, right? Yeah. So slowing down the breath, calming the breath down, especially inside of a training, right? That's something yeah. that a lot of people don't do, don't focus on. So we, 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 do, uh, we do a lot of that um, as far as you know, um, soft tissue work again, one to two times a week, yeah. you know, would be ideal. And then some form of aerobic work, low intensity, mapatone running or, or even low impact swimming, something like that, keeping the heart rate below 120 just for blood flow. Totally. You know, I do a lot of rough walking now. I'm, I'm actually getting ready for a 150 mile walk. Hell so, yeah, man. I just got yeah. into that myself. You did? See, this yeah. is what happened. When you turn 35, you start doing other shit. Right? You're like, wait, I can walk. <laughs> yeah, we can walk. I was like, no, but it... I walk. So there's another thing. Like, I, <sighs> and that's another good point. I walk one to two times a day. Yeah. Right? That's a big Re part. Reading, reading, right? Clearing your mind. Yeah. I find that when I learn something new, it allows me to feel good and confident about myself. Yeah. So then it, it relieves that tension it relieves anxiety right yeah going for a walk and clearing my mind listening to binaural beats or something something that is going to either make me enthusiastic um mm -hmm. keep me upbeat or relax my body depending on how i feel right if i feel highly mm -hmm. in high anxiety maybe i'll go ahead and i'll do something relaxing right i'll listen to <laughs> you know 432 hertz or something like that it's so funny when you talk to it's like the you get into to fitness and everyone just works out super hard. They train really hard. They get stronger, stronger. You keep pushing along that line and you talk to people like yourself that have they've made a career out of this. They're highly skilled. Their knowledge is expansive and they've worked with the, the most competitive people in their different sports. And what you find is at the top of this mountain, they're all walking. They're sleeping better. They're meditating. It's like you're doing the most un-aggro, un-alpha stuff because – it has such a big payout in a reduction of overall stress on the body. And that that's yeah. like the biggest detractor from longevity is you could look strong and shit, but are you constantly in a state of stress every single moment of your life? Can you go through a roll and have zero control of your breath 
Do you even yep. know that you breathe when you do anything? What does that feel like? Have you ever thought about that? And you start to talk to people about this and they go, you know, you're working with a new client and you're teaching them bracing, right? On something like a deadlift. And you go, okay, we're going to inhale, brace as you drive off the floor, sharp exhale and, and squeeze everything around your abdomen. And they go on the way down. <laughs> they don't even know. They don't even know that there's an in and an out happening in the yep. thing at all at baseline yeah. without someone else attacking them, without your partner punching you in the face, without any of those things. What was the moment in your training career in, in all of this where you were like, holy shit, breathing, this is, this is uh, a new, this is like something that totally matters. I'm going to dive into this. I need to know more about yeah. that. I think this was around 2019 or 2018, actually before COVID, right? Yeah. Which you Okay, maybe COVID helped out. That allowed people to understand the breath more, right? With right, COVID. right, right. Oh, uh, this was actually way before that because what I needed to do. The good thing about, I, I think the, I think the best thing that happened in my career was obviously being able to work with high level individuals mm -hmm. that were veterans, not not yeah. young numbers, because you basically you can give them anything and they're going to get better, right? Right. It's that one to 05 percent better is really where you got to dive deep and figure out. Yeah, what yeah, you know. yeah. And one of those things were, well, it was two things. It was mobility and it was breath. And so I go, a lot of these guys are upper chest breathers, right? They're very, you know, sympathetic tone. And I was like, your mouth breathing because a lot of them had deviated septums. So right, it's like, broken nose. custom to breathing through the nose. So when I went deeper into that, and I think I, I think I may have, heard it from Cal D's first uh, mentioned it hmm. I think in a podcast he was like yeah. look up oxygen advantage and I and I remembered it and then I got the audio book and then I wrote I, I bought the real book and then I was like you know what there's a certification course let me go ahead and do that too as well yeah and so it just went deeper on it and I found that you know utilizing that gave us when we talked about that one percent or that x factor that was another x factor that we were able to utilize you know yeah utilizing breath holds be before fights right doing mm -hmm. max breath holds before fights and then box breathing and then going back to it you know so it was like it was a good way to stimulate calm the body down then stimulate and allow them to adapt to the stresses right right being able to cope with air hunger right that was a major thing that's and a unique one too when you start to do breath holds and you feel when you realize you can go a lot further past the point that you think you need to breathe when co2 starts to build up yep. that's a super unique feeling that kind of it well, like flips a switch when you break through that and turns your world upside down well that's the thing it's like and you know you you train so it's yep. when you feel like you're, you're suffocating in there like you can't breathe yeah you start to do things that you're you're not really <laughs> supposed to do right yeah, you yeah to totally you start to panic <laughs> yeah and i think that you know they do that with uh you know uh deep sea divers and yeah. even seals do it as well because I, I talked with um even with eddie we talked about it and um you know the goal is to allow them to be comfortable again being uncomfortable and yeah. this is one of the ways you can do that in a controlled environment so you do it maybe while we're doing a fight specific circuit or you do it while they're sparring right or you do it while they're pushing a prowler they know they're not going to die but the goal is, is to get them to that edge and then bring them back get them to the right. edge and don't push them over the edge because then you're then you're fucked but get them to the edge bring them back and then from there they know physiologically they can handle it and psychologically they're able to cope with that so that's the biggest thing is merging those two have you done any i know you like uh, conducting studies and like getting numbers on people and stuff. Have you ever done anything on the like oxygen or well, not oxygen restriction, but like breath holds, carbon dioxide buildup and how it relates to power production in a mm -hmm. fighter? Cause you see someone like, uh, I think it was Iz Izzy came out and for like the first three rounds, he didn't even mm -hmm. breathe through his mouth. And that was the first time where I was like, they worked on that. That's not accidental. He, yep. they worked on that in training. That was something they focused on. And he's in here. It's a, a whole head game, too. Because this mm -hmm. guy is cool as a cucumber fighting you. And there's no, he's not doing anything that people well, normally do through their mouth, you know? I think Izzy has more of a martial arts mindset, too, as well. True. Yeah. So he yeah. can enter himself a little bit more than, say, and there's different types of fighters, right? Yep. 
you have the martial artist, you have, again, just a regular, just fighter. I think that's like, a, you know, like a, a Mike Perry type. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Shout out Mike Perry, too. Um, yeah. You have a competitor who is like, you know, I just want to compete. No matter what it is, I compete in everything. That's like Michael Jordan, right? Yeah. You have an athlete that is used to just be, he's, an, he's a guy that can do anything, right? That's yeah. kind of what I was kind of put in, right? It's like, you know, you played college football and then you can transfer and do anything, right? Then you have, like like we said, the martial artist who really goes deeper into more of the metaphysical side or the psychological side and kind of centers themselves a little bit more. And I think Izzy has that because he's an artist, right? Yeah. He's an artist who's trying to find themselves, right? And he finds themselves in the most extreme circumstances. Yeah. So I think what the breath did is centered himself to where it allowed him to be confident, to be present and be in control. And so right. when you look at some form of breathing, wh whether it be Buteyko, whether it be Wim Hof, whatever the case, um, whatever it's, whatever style you want to do that's going to help you center yourself and relieve tension, mm -hmm. it allows you to be powerful because you're relaxed. Right. See? So I think that one, if you want to look at it from more of a biochemical standpoint, you're not accumulating a lot of lactate. You know, you're getting rid of that negative byproduct there with CO2. Right. Um, and you're bringing in oxygen in an efficient manner, opening up the nasal cavity, improving on nitric oxide or increasing nitric oxide to help vasodilation, which will yep. improve oxygen to the working tissue. So from that side, it makes sense, too. But from a psychological side, if I'm breathing normal and I know I am and I can feel it and then I look on the other side of the cage or the other side of the ring and that guy's panting and he's nervous yeah. and he, you see he's got anxiety or he's shaking, I have already won. So when I go yeah. into the round, I'm so confident that anything that I do, I'm just like I'm sparking off on him. Right. And that's a feeling that few have. And when you can tap into that, it's like, you know, I think he's like – um he likes that comic con shit. So like, you know, super saint type style, yeah. you know? <laughs> well, it's like, uh, I, Yuri Prohaska is very much like that too. He's super mm -hmm. like, uh, I, I think you said it well, like the metaphysical side sure, yeah. of martial arts. Um, I know in, um, in James Nestor's book and then in, in Patrick's book, they talk about, uh, like the buildup of nitric oxide and you, you can do this by like, you know, plugging your nose, rocking back and forth and then doing something. Uh, mm -hmm. I rem I think well, who is it? It's like a uh, Gat Sports or something made a supplement that was like a nitric oxide booster, right? And when yep. I started to read about breathing, I was like, "Oh my god, you can do this just manually by yourself yeah. with nothing else." Mm -hmm. From a training perspective, uh, if we're talking about like you want to increase someone's punch power, right? Let's say that they don't come into it with with a powerful punch and you measure this and you know that that's something you want to work on. Mm -hmm. Is there a value in doing something like those, um, like those breath holds to build up nitric oxide in the body to then help with that mm. production of energy? And then do you do that kind of intermittently? I just feel like that's a tough thing to get someone on board with. It's so nuanced that if you can't yep. show them definitively, like, yo, we're going to work on doing something very basic, like breathing through your nose instead of your mouth. They're going to be mm -hmm. like, dude, I don't got time for that. You know, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to get people on board. But once they're on board and they feel the benefit, it can be a game so, changer. I, I think from a coaching standpoint to help with buy-in is to do those breath holds. And we did that a lot with a lot of the UFC guys. Yeah. Um, and what we saw was even with the paces, right? Monitoring their paces. Uh, so, like skipping or? or... No, just walking. Oh, so they gotcha. monitor, yep, yep. Max breath hold. Normal breath in, normal breath out, hold the nose, walk, right? For steps. For steps. Yeah, yeah. So we had an individual, a UFC fighter, who started at, I believe, at a baseline, he started at 60 paces, 60 steps. Okay. Right? Within a two to three week span, as he, we did this consecutively, we probably did it three times a week, he got up to 120 steps on a max oh. breath hold. Which is significant. That's very that's a that's long a time. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> then he got all the way up to 180 and I had to shut it down because at that point, like CO2 wasn't an issue. Then you're like, well, damn. Right, right. Now I, I don't want him to not breathe right. because 
like we can't have that either. So there is a um, yeah, you, yeah, know, yeah. Thing yeah. Now, you know, but um, but yeah, and what that did do in time was if they had the power to begin with, we knew that they had the ability to repeat that power for a longer duration of time. Mm. So I don't know. I don't have the, I don't have obviously the evidence. I don't have right. the data. I don't have anything of that research to showcase power production as a whole. But I can say just based off of just basic science that if I can improve my repeatability and I already have the power, well now I'll be able to right. be powerful for all three or five rounds. That's a hard thing I think that a lot of people don't fully grasp is to be powerful is one thing. And that, that in and of itself is hard. It's hard to build that. But to be repeatedly powerful is a very different thing. And when you, you look at some fighters, when they're able to punch people hard a lot, that's a crazy thing to build. How do you work on that with athletes? Like even someone, I mean, Dustin Poirier has incredible hands, right? How do you make sure that the 60th punch in round mm -hmm. four is the same as punch three in round one? Well, we look at we look at all the bioenergetic demands of the sport, right? So what I want to see is first, I want to see him have a great base. And mm -hmm. an individual like Dustin Poirier has a great base. He has a great VO2 max. He has a great maximum aerobic speed test. He has he has the ability to deliver oxygen very efficiently. So if we look at limiters, then his limiter might be you know, his ability to utilize that oxygen. So maybe getting him stronger will improve on that. So we're looking at the limiters first, improving on the limiters. And then from there, once we get into a, a, a full camp, usually around six to eight weeks out, now we're going to start to improve on his repeatability, right? So his power production and then a short rest interval followed by another power movement, right? Yeah. So it could be anything like, repeated every minute on the minute kettlebell swings it could be prowler pushes it can be med ball throws at a certain uh, velocity we can use velocity based training to allow us to stay like to stay accurate in the actual speed that we're trying to produce and make sure that we have incomplete rest to do so so either using a vbt monitor like a gym aware or now we use yep. a proteus device or we use a proteus machine to machine. mount to allow it's us to keep the power going and keep it in the same zone and then also making sure that they have the ability to do it over and over again. Hold on. And, yep. And that's like the, the Petraeus machine. That's where you grip and it's kind of like a landmine attachment, right? And so you're able to like power rotate or power row and it gives you a readout of how much you're producing and like wattage as you're doing that. Yeah. It gives us a uh, peak and mean velocity and peak power. So, it does. And then also we can stay now with the Proteus device. We can keep them in the zones of where we want to try, where we're trying to go. Oh, whether wow. Whether it's explosive power, so on and so forth. Yeah. It's so crazy that y you can get so in the weeds on this stuff and so yeah. finite. And at the end of the day, you can walk in there and some dude can just wheelhouse you in the face and you're out <laughs> cold. And it's like, <laughs> you know, you could be, it, these guys are un believable athletes it really is something special but i mean even this last weekend watching khalil roundtree and anthony smith both guys are phenoms anthony smith is not to be slept on and yeah. boom just like that oh yeah that yeah. was wild that's the fight game you know it's the hardest part is going through you know an eight to twelve week camp and it ends that quick or it ends you know in that fashion yeah um, i mean i know guys that that don't like to you know, I got a lot of young up and comers that are that are getting knockouts very quickly, especially in the boxing world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you kind of want to keep them, you want to carry them until like the second or third or fourth round, so that you can get the time in there. But a lot right. of times, yeah, yeah, death, and and you catch them, you may knock them out in the first round, and you don't learn anything. But and the same thing goes for somebody who you know obviously gets knocked out. You never want that to happen. But what did you learn from that if it was in the first seven seconds or the first minute? Right. Oh, and yeah, it could be a technical flaw. It could be a, a tactical issue, whatever. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, that's the part for the course in the, in the game of, of the fight world, you know what I'm saying? So like the major thing when it comes down to preparation is to get them confident, yeah. right? That's like, we look at like, what's the goal here overall, the overarching goal, um, from a 
from a strength and conditioning or a sport performance standpoint is to get them confident enough that when they get into the cage, they know they're physically and, and mentally capable of withstanding any type of hardship totally. and being able to, to end the fight when it's necessary. And that's where things, I mean, things like breath matter, because if their limiter is uh, control and anxiety, then teaching them how to breathe and control that could be, you know, equally as valuable as adding 10% to their peak strength. So, you know, what? choosing from that palate, you know, about, I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. you know, about, you know, training in general, it's like, you don't ever, re have you fought before you fought professionally? I've competed in jujitsu, but no, I have not, not so, mixed martial arts. <laughs> Even in competing in, in, in jiu-jitsu tournaments, it's like yeah. if you're prepared mentally and you go, I got the gas tank to go the whole entire round. I got the gas tank to go the entire day. It really does. It allows you to, to fully let off all of your skills. Totally. Right? It, it yes. allows you to go all in. When somebody has uh, second thoughts on their actual conditioning, that's the biggest issue. So totally. whenever a fighter comes in, there's either one or two things that they want to improve. It's either going to be, I want to get more power or I want to improve my conditioning. It's never, I want to get stronger. I mean, it, you know, seldom I would say. Right, 20, right. And it's never like I need to, you know, improve my speed or something of that nature. Right. It's really conditioning or power. And you look at it, you go, well, all right, let's, let's look at it. Let's get a, let's get a lay of the land, right? Let's get an assessment built going and see what's going on from there. And a lot of times it could be, it could be a postural issue. It could be a, you know, obviously a respiratory issue where they're not able to take in that oxygen. It could be just their biomechanics in general, right? They're not, they're not utilizing the breath appropriately. They're not breathing in through the nasal cavity. They're not increasing diaphragmatic response. They're not improving on their ability to take in that oxygen through the diaphragm. And they're just focusing on upper chest breathing and keeping right. it more aesthetic. And, um, those little changes right there can totally transfer a man's game or, or a woman's game um, for the better. So not only am I improving on, like we said, the overall physiology, but we're also improving on the psychology of their ability to do work inside the cage of the ring. It's touching on, on psychology, I, I'd love to get your perspective on this because you've had experience on like tactical ranges with people you have experience in fight sports and then also fighting yourself and training. When you look at, at strength as the concept, right. And I spoke with a, a recon Marine about this on last week's episode mm. about the demands of like combat there. There's basically there's strength that you possess or don't possess as an individual. And then there's going to be different environments that demand you to utilize that in various capacities. And I think of, the octagon on fight night as kind of like a peak example of that utilization. And then I think of uh, like an actual battlefield as another peak example, because that's like high stress, high anxiety. Uh, it's a, it, it maybe even ratcheted up more so because it's truly life or death. It's not, yeah. it's life or death in the cage, but it's more metaphorical life or death. It's I'm coming yeah. for you. You're coming for me. But at the end of the day, the ref's going to step in. If either one of yeah. us look like we're going to hear, he's going to shut it down. So in these two settings, uh, the training from, from having talked to service members and then having talked to coaches and athletes, it does seem to kind of be all over the place to some degree. Because the demands are different, right? Like if you're in a battle, you have a rucksack, you have a weapon, and you have an undetermined amount of distance that you may or may not have to cover. Plus your rest is affected because you got to sleep in a foxhole or something like that. Yeah. So from your experience being on ranges, from your experience talking with service members, training pro athletes, yeah. how do you think that these two arenas vary in in their utilization of strength and then how people should be preparing for either of them. So if you're like, uh, mm. maybe you're talking to someone who's getting ready to enlist or they're getting ready to go to buds or they're getting ready to, uh, do their first regional, you know, martial arts fight at a casino. Yeah. How do you view those differently despite them both being extremely demanding in the peak, uh, the peak examples? Well, you got to prepare for everything, which is, it's a sucky answer, but that's really what it is, right? Yeah. So the reason why I run a concurrent conjugate style of an approach, because I want them prepared and ready at all times. Mm -hmm. So anything that we do, and again, it's going to be focused on certain tasks at certain times of, 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 
of the year or whatever. Right. But, you know, improving on, again, their foundational patterns, improving on the strength in those patterns that are going to be obviously used in everyday life and what they're doing in, inside their tasks. Right. When you're looking at with tactical and combat sports, there's a huge amount of psychological demand, right? It's, it's also hand-eye coordination, it's balance, it's depth perception, it's um, memorization, it's um, impulse control. There's a lot of things that go inside, okay. not just physically, but mentally. So when you put it together from a strength perspective, we want them physically strong enough to withstand, again, the, the, the demands of what's going to happen. And we want them to have endurance, not just physical endurance, but mental endurance. And especially when it comes down to whether it be, you know, special operations, whether it be a UFC fight, they need to have the, a psychological advantage. Otherwise, their opponents will have it. And then from right. there, they're at a disadvantage. So what we want to do is, I'll go back to it, it's like getting them strong enough to where they, they understand that they can take care of themselves in any situation possible. Now, you use data and you use numbers so that you can showcase that to give them the psychological advantage. If right. I improved on my squat, if I improved on my deadlift, if I improved on, you know, my power clean or whatever the case, anything that you want to use from a uh, from objective standpoint, right, from objective indicator standpoint, that will have some type of correlation as long as you can transfer it, as long as you can reframe it to where it's important for them to really have. Yep. It shows that, okay, we're getting better and we're ready and we're improving and we're capable of withstanding all of this load that's going to be put upon us, whether it be in buds or whatever, right? Right. So you can never really get ready for buds. I, I don't know if anybody told you that. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> like, you either have it or you don't have it. Yeah. You know, I fuck with numerous amount of SEALs and, like, these guys just have something different in them, right? Yeah. And a lot of times with UFC fighters, it's like they're just a special type of crazy. That yeah. is what it is. You got to have that. Now, it can be enhanced through the training, but that person has to have that special thing about them, right? Yeah. Yeah, so, the psychology of those two fields is something to be reckoned with. I mean, the, determina the determination, but also just like the ability to shut down all, shut down all care, all concern, and just kind of like slog through the literal sand and mud and like, pop out on the other it's like the guys that get in dog fights you know it's round 25 and uh they're covered in blood and they're stomping on the cage waiting for the bell to ring because they can't wait to get into the fifth it's you crazy. gotta have yeah you gotta have a slight bit of an ego yeah. right you gotta have a slight bit of an ego you gotta have a crazy amount of confidence in yourself knowing that you can withstand anything right mm -hmm. I was in one fight, uh, my my pro was my second pro fight, and we were going, and I thought that at one point I was gonna die. Like I thought it was over, like because I was physically exhausted, and I think I couldn't see at all. Yeah, uh, and I kept thinking to myself, "You better not lose in front of all these people," and that's an ego thing. Totally. Right? Better Thank not God. Quit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> better not quit. Yeah. Otherwise, you're a pussy or whatever the case. Yeah. But that type of mentality keeps people going. Totally. That type of mentality keeps people wanting to improve. Right. So a, a person like David Goggins, he needed that and he still does it to this day because he feels inadequate. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's that level of inadequacy that keeps us pushing. So strength comes in all forms. It's not just physical. And I always say that, you know, obviously you want to improve on your physical capabilities, but a large amount of the fight game, a large amount in the tactical world is, is mental 90% of it. And a lot of, and I know we could put a percentage on it for real. Like it's obviously not the direct amount, but really if you think about it, all that stuff comes through the mind. So, I mean, we want to make sure that, uh, that you're capable and willing to withstand that hardship at any point right. in time. So I guess I don't know if that answered your question, but no, it does. I mean, I think that that's, that's that like good to great mindset, right? Like there's a difference, but the difference between good athletes or good fighters and the greatest fighters of all time is that they 
everyone's good. By the time the cage latches, everyone's good. Everyone's skilled. They all beat the amateur circuit. They all beat the cage warrior circuit. They all, whatever it is, everyone who's standing there at that point, they already did it. So you're mm -hmm. not in there against a scrub. You're in there against someone who's a dog. And yeah. you, there are instances where technique can win. Like Khalil landed an incredibly precise combo, exactly how they trained, and he put him down. Yeah. But a lot of times it seems that it's going to be a war of attrition. And when that's mm -hmm. what's happening, yes, you rely on the, the strength that you built to feel confident about what you're doing. You rely on your mindset training to feel confident about what you're doing. But if you're in your fight and you feel like you're going to fucking die and you can't see, yeah, what are you made of? And only sure. people like yourself who have been in that situation can actually answer that question. That's something a lot of people can think about. I can sit here and think about it. But I, I think to answer it's different. Do it. I still think you can do it, and I think that's why an individual like Goggins or you know any of these guys that do like ultra marathons and, and do these crazy challenges is they they need that. They need yeah. to see if they can get there. And people, some people will say, "Oh, they're crazy. Like, why would you want to put yourself through that, or why would you want to jump out of an airplane?" Well, some people need to feel that. Otherwise, they yeah. they, they feel alive. They feel like they're just you know clogging through life and having no real purpose you know i mean those so, are the moments that you feel that i feel most alive are like yeah exactly. like that it's like when you're in the fourth round in a tournament or something you're in the fourth round all rounds have been five minutes you've been exhausted yeah. and you're testing I'm you're testing. at your limit and you're wondering what it's like on the other side of it absolutely and that absolutely. feels al alive you know yeah yeah for sure well phil it's uh I could I could probably talk to you all day about this. I know I want to be respectful of your time here. Um, the la last thing I wanted to touch on, uh, conceptually, like when you got into training, what was the thing that made you want to work in in fight sports? Like, wh what was the draw towards this? Honestly, all things you could do. Yeah, no, I mean, I've worked with. It's funny because people would just know me as working with fighters, but I work with a lot of individuals. I work with college football, high school football, NFL, um, track and field, general pop, I obviously work with Timberland. I work with some celebrities, but like, I think that one, it's like, uh, there's a bond there because I've already fought and yeah. martial arts in general and fighters in general, we just have a, a similar mindset. Everybody has that similar mindset. Like you can, you can always, even with your opponents, like you connect with your opponent after you're yeah. done fighting, you know, like I still talk to some of my opponents or you know, the guys that I fought before, it's just, it's primal. And you just have a, a bond with those individuals. They're always willing to, to work. They're always willing to, to learn new things, you know, depending on the person, obviously. But for the most part, that's what it is. And uh, watching and preparing somebody for a fight uh, is a lot different in, in, in all aspects than, you know, getting somebody ready uh, for a birthday party. <laughs> or a wedding. Yeah. yeah. No, no it's offense, different. You know, and so for them, like, 100%, everybody got to get ready for something, you know, get, get their birthday suit on. But, like, you know, but, but it's, it's uh, I'm solving a bigger problem, yeah. you know, and that's the thing. I want to solve big problems. And even if it's like now to the point where I'm going more into more of the functional health side, whereas I want to help people with autoimmune disease, I want to help people with certain dysfunction and, yeah. If that's more because of the fact that I see uh, the problems that, that my fighters go through after they get done with their career. Right. So there's a huge amount of hormonal dysfunction. There's a huge amount of metabolic dysfunction. So getting into that world and allowing me to transition out of the fight game and into more of a functional health side and then also a leadership role with my coaches, helping other coaches, that's really what I'm focused on now. Um, allowing my coaches to step in and work with these fighters and giving them guidance and mentorship. That's, that's where I'm going. But yeah, I mean, I think when I started, it was like, it just made sense. You know, I was already fighting at the time. So working with my teammates, just, it was a good marriage and, and I kept it going, you know, and, and did, uh, hopefully it, it works out in the long run, but I think it's, it's done well so far. Did, did you have any resistance there when, um, I think when, especially in the training industry, because it's an individualistic career, you can find yourself finding success because you built your business and you manage your clients. And now you're in a position where you're trying to mentor and uplift and teach other people. 
to do that, was it hard to distance yourself from that leadership and go like, all right, I'm going to delegate and elevate here. Uh, how's this going to go? <laughs> I think every transition, every pivot, um, every step up, you yeah. kind of go through. I did that when I was fighting. I was like, man, I'm, I'm still in my career and I'm, try I'm trying to coach. And I was battling this thing for a while. And then, you know, I finally made the decision to go all in on coaching. And the same thing right. goes for this. Now, instead of being on the floor coaching, I'm, I'm more so in front of a camera or working right. with other coaches and, and getting on calls and building businesses and things of that nature, maybe even doing speaking. And when you fully make that change, you got to be comfortable with the change. You got to, yeah. you got to commit to the change. If you don't commit to the change and you're in one foot in, one foot out, you're not going to be successful either or. So it's like right. when, once you decide, make the decision and go after it. The pivot is there. Just make sure that you're making the right decision. And nine times out of 10, if it's really in the, in your gut and you feel it's important for you, then go after it. The mic drop moment, man. It's very true. Following your intuition, but it's hard, man, to go all in, all yep. in to truly do that. People say that all the time, but to really go all in is hard, but it's the only well, way that you can find out if it's going to work or not. It's the only I way. I believe it. It's sacrifice. It's sacrifice 100%. risk, you know, yep. um, but it's a calculated risk if you do your homework right. So I'm never I've never been one to, to shy away from a challenge. You know, I've never been one to really uh, be nervous about a certain action that I needed to take. So uh, I, I'm, I don't gamble, but, you know, I, I do take risk. I'll calculate. gamble on myself all fucking day. That's the 100%. best risk to take, right? It's scary. 100%. I don't think it's any less scary than something else but when you but know your work ethic is it, really a, is it really a gamble when you have all of the information needed i think it's just no. a, <laughs> i think it's just a that has been calculated you know what i mean i think you calculate it for longer maybe than you than you state you do like mm -hmm. that calculation is probably happening you knew you didn't want to work for someone else right so like you're fighting you're thinking about going coaching you already know you're not going to do that you're not going to show up for somebody else's dream. And so yeah. the calculation probably started then. And sure. then you just buy into it a little bit more and more as you go. But you're going to do exactly. great stuff, man. I, I already, you know, I'm such a big fan of the stuff you put out. It's thorough. It's well thought through. I think that's something that we need in the fitness space right now because there's an abundance of just like bullshit. So <laughs> it's always good when there's people that are, are veterans that know what they're talking about are invested in their athletes and they're invested in making stuff that's like your information is useful to anybody that comes across it that's interested yeah. in bettering themselves for the sports they love to do so uh, it means a lot that you came on here man i appreciate it phil thank you man i appreciate the time bro and uh keep doing your thing man i love i love Absolutely. the professionalism and uh, how you coordinate and organize things so keep it up brother i appreciate it hey friends abe here thank you so much for tuning into this episode and sticking around to the very end. If you want to support it, leave a five-star review on Spotify or check out www.mainideapodcast.com. Join the mailing list and stay up to date on all things The Main Idea from future guests, sponsorship opportunities, products that I'm using to help me perform at my best, invites to ask me anything, and any upcoming pertinent information to the show. I cannot do this show without you. It is literally why I show up each week and put these episodes together. So thank you from the bottom of my heart from being part of the community. I hope you have a great day.